Hello everyone! The world of Warcraft has a lot of fighting and war in its stories, but sometimes, amongst the fires of hatred, a seed of love finds room to grow. With Valentine's Day soon upon us, we take a look at my top 10 love stories in World of Warcraft. At number 10, we have a love story that's only been introduced in the recent expansion, and unfortunately, it wasn't meant to last. Those that have done the Alliance Garrison campaign know who I'm talking about, and those that really want to avoid spoilers from the Alliance campaign, you might want to skip to number 9. For those that don't care about spoilers, you might know who I'm talking about. It's obviously Barris Alexton and Lieutenant Forn. Alexton and Forn, they both joined the Alliance campaign into Drenor. Alexton, he was brought in to help build the garrison, and back in the day, he worked on re building Stormwind with the Stonemasons Guild. As some of you might know, the Stonemasons Guild didn't get the money that they were promised. Edwin Van Cleef, he led riots through the streets, and during these riots, Varian Rin's wife died. Alexton, he did not join Van Cleef and his future Defiance Brotherhood. Instead, he remained within the city, and he became the city's architect. From a simple builder to a man with a high position, he came to Drenor, where he met Lieutenant Forn. Not much was known about Forn before this time, except that apparently she did help us during the campaign in Pandaria, but Barros, he didn't need to know much. He saw this Gildanean woman and his heart pounding in his chest, while she was also intrigued by the man. They would ask adventurers, who do many months spent on Drenor about each other, but both they were either too shy or too busy to really make a move. One day, Alexton finally got the courage to make that move to tell Forn how much he loves her. He asked of the commander if they could find a rose from Azeroth, since this is Forn's favorite flower, and as luck would have it, a rose is growing in our herb garden. We bring back the rose to Alexton, but in the meantime, the Burning Blade Clan, led by Azuka Blade Fury, they infiltrated the garrison in search for the heart of Gorgarek. Torn was able to keep them all safe for the moment, but we need to scout the garrison and make sure that any Burning Blade member is taken out. As we make sure that the base is secure, inside our town hall more assassins make their way in and they try to take out Lieutenant Forn. The assassins appeared out of nowhere. Barros took the blade that was meant for my heart. I ripped out the throat of our attacker, but I was too late. Barros gave me this flower before he passed and Torn holds up the rose as a tear rolls down her cheek. Their love story was cut short before it even began. Forn is heartbroken and now forever remains within her worgen form. She looks at her favorite flower given to her by the man whose heart will always be with her. Do not let fear stop you from taking a chance at a brighter future, since before you know it, the choice will be taken out of your hands. You'll forever be wishing and asking yourself, what if? At number 9, we have Chandris Feramun and Jared Shadowsong. Many years ago, during the War of the Ancients, in which the Night Elves had to fight against the Burning Legion, Chandris, she lost her parents and became an orphan. She was found by a young Night Elf priest known as Tyrande Whisperwind, who kept her safe and would later adopt her as her own daughter. During this war, Jared Shadowsong, he was unwillingly pushed into the role as a leader of the Night Elf forces, and he even had to face off against Archimond himself. The Burning Legion would lose the war, but the the victory came at a great price. The land of Kalimdor, it was shattered, and many lives and families were destroyed. But in the destruction, Jared and Chandris, they grew affection for each other. Chandris, she was very open about her feelings, while Jared needed a little time to warm up. But eventually, he too found comfort in her smiles. Yet, fate had different plans in mind. Jared, he never wanted to roll as leader or to roll as hero. And he felt that Malfurion and his people, they were more concerned with nature than they were with their own people. Over time, Jared would place himself more and more in the background, while also getting into a relationship with a novice priest called Shalazir. Together, they moved away from the rest of their people, from Chandris and everyone else, and they lived out their lives in personal exile. Chandris, she was left with no choice but to forget about Jared, as she focused on becoming a better fighter, and eventually she would even become the general of the Night Elf Sentinels. For around 10,000 years, nobody heard a thing about Jared, and most assumed that he and Chalazir were dead. The battle at Mount Hyjal would again be a great victory over the Legion, but with a terrible price, since the destruction of the World Tree Northern Sail meant the end of the Night Elves' immortality. Jared's wife Chalazir, she fell ill due to old age, and they had agreed that Jared would bring Chalazir back to their people, so that Tyrande and Elune could try to save her. In truth, Chalazir actually knew that her time had come, she wanted to die amongst her own people, and she wanted 
wanted to make sure that Jared would not be left alone as she passed on. Now, Jared was reunited with his people, and of course, he met with Chandris. She told him that once she had romantic feelings for him, and she envied the time that Shalazir was able to spend with Jared. He, of course, was flattered by her feelings, and he apologized for suddenly disappearing, but he also knew that their relation, at least at this time, could be nothing more than a platonic relationship. Chandris accepted this, she had no choice, and she offered her condolences for his loss. In the rest of the story, and this is all told in the novel Wolfheart, Jared finds out that his sister, Maya Shadow Song, she's gone crazy, and she's planning to murder the Highborn and Malfurion. He discovers all of his sister's plans, he prevents her from killing Malfurion, he confronts her in a battle, but he's unable to kill his own sister. Maiev, she escapes the scene, and we don't know what happened to her, but what we do know is that Jared, he's appointed by Tyrande to take over his sister's role as leader of the Watchers. Tyrande then gives Chandris the task to help Jared with picking out new possible recruits, and of course Chandris, her knowledge and skills would be for great help, but Tyrande's motivations are more than that. She hopes by placing Chandris and Jared together, that their feelings for each other might get room to grow. Who knows what the future might bring for these two, sometimes life, it just offers different roads, and no matter how strong you might feel for one another, sometimes it's just not the right time or place. Perhaps fate has given these two night elves a second chance, and perhaps now they'll be able to walk the road together. And number 8, it's the Guardian Medivh and Garona half Orkan. If there's ever been an unlikely love story within World of Warcraft, then it's probably this one. At the time, the Guardian Medivh, he was possessed by the Titan Sargeras. It was Sargeras that made contact with the Orguldan and showed him the planet of Azeroth. This was a planet full of life, water, plenty of enemies for orcs to kill. They worked together into creating the Dark Portal, and they linked Azeroth with Draenor to start the first orcish invasion. Sargeras, he had the plan in mind to weaken the world of Azeroth and get it ready for another Burning Legion invasion, and the orcs, they were a great tool for the job. Now Gul'dan, he was twisted, he was always in search of more power, and he was more than willing to work together with Medivh. This wasn't his only scheme though, he had several small little plans here and there, and one of them was breeding an assassin that could infiltrate the different clans and be used to be his eyes and ears. At first we believed that Corona was half orc half human, but later would be revealed that she's actually half orc and half Draenei. Gul'dan took this half breed, he tortured her, he placed magical spells on her mind, he trained her in the ways of the assassin, and he made sure that she remained obedient. When the orcs invaded Azeroth, Corona, she made contact with Medivh, and she became an ambassador of the orcs. Medivh in the role of Guardian, he was charged with keeping Azeroth safe, and he believed that war was not the only solution. He wanted to communicate with the orcs, he wanted to use Corona as a tool to work towards peace, but of course, this was just a mask used by Sargeras. He was still inside the body of the Guardian, and he wanted orcs and humans to clash with each other, to murder and kill, so this demonic force would have an easy planet to conquer. Now the real Medivh, hidden deep inside, he worked in secret to place people around him that would be willing to take him out when the moment arrived. People like Khadgar and Enwin Lothar were his pawns against the corruption inside of him, and every so often, Medivh was able to take control and push Sargeras to the background. You'd imagine that if you have this ability, that these moments would be used to prevent Sargeras from taking the world, from destroying everything, to warn people about what was going on, but instead, Medivh found himself drawn to Garona and Garona to him. Their love defies all logic and in a moment of passion in which they left the world behind, Garona became pregnant with Medivh's son. Yes, that's right, while being possessed by an evil titan while losing control over his body, Medivh found enough time to be romantic and get together with a half-orc half Draenei. Love will find a way, my friends. Let's just keep it at that. Eventually, Sargeras, he would regain control over Medivh, and people like Khadgar would discover their secrets. They found out that Medivh was possessed, they confronted the corrupted Guardian, and Medivh, or Sargeras, literally drained the life out of Khadgar. Garona was also there during this final confrontation, and he filled Garona's mind with horrible visions. But Khadgar, he was able to stab Medivh, and Enduin Lothar finished the job by chopping off his head. Garona would spend her life dealing with the horrors of the past while being unable to take properly care of her son. Garona knew that she was a liability to Badam, but that's a whole different story. The story of Garona and Medivh is proof that love has no boundaries. Not even one of the most powerful beings in the Warcraft universe can stand up against the power of love.
Number seven is a magical kind of love, and Vina Teak and the blue dragon Caligos. When Arthas turned to the dark side, he was told to resurrect Kalfuzad, and for this they used the powers of the Sunwell. This action would corrupt the fountain of power, and Kilfus and his people, they were forced to destroy it in order to prevent its corruption from spreading. Not all of the power was lost though, some of it remained behind, and the red dragon Coriolstras, he realized that sooner or later, someone would find out about this and come look Looking for it. And that is why he collected the power of the Sunwell, he gave it the disguise of a human girl named Envina Teague. He then hid her away from the world with her own fake family and her own fake memories. The Blue Dragon Caligos was sent by Malagos to investigate the surrounding area of the Sunwell, since Blue Dragons, they always had an affinity for magic and they felt that something was not right. Caligos, he went to investigate, but as he made his way, a group of dragon hunters that were put on the task of shooting him down, they shot him out of the sky. Before they were able to get their hands on Calig though, he was rescued by Envina and this was the start of a big adventure. Darkhan a blood elf that had betrayed his people to Arvis in exchange for more power, he knew that the powers of the Sunwell were not completely gone and he was looking for them. Eventually he found out that Envina was that power that he was searching for and he kidnapped her right off Kalik's hands. Kalik did all he could to make his way back to Envina to rescue her and in the end he was able to save her life while Envina realized who and what she truly was. She was the power of the Sunwell itself and no one, especially not someone like Dark and Rafir, would be able to to stand against her. She unleashed her powers, they assumed that she destroyed Darkon, although he would later show up again, but besides that, the world was saved, the day was saved, and Vina was fine, and they promised to keep her powers and her true identity a secret. As a blue dragon, Caligos always had an affinity for magic, and this being of pure raw power had stolen his heart, not only because she was the sun well, but because she was kind and strong. Coriolstras might have created an illusion to hide her away, but that illusion had started to live a life of its own, and she too felt love for Calig. Their time together would be short, since during the Burning Crusade we find out that Kilfa Sunstrider, he has teamed up with Kil Jaden and the Burning Legion. He attacked his own people and he kidnapped Envina to use her powers for evil. They planned to drain the remaining powers of the Sunwell to open up a portal for Kil Jaden, and this would allow him to come onto Azeroth and conquer the planets. Thankfully, heroes of Azeroth were able to prevent Kil Jaden from even setting foot on the planets, but Envina, she was forced to sacrifice herself for the one she loved. The nightmare is over! The spell is broken! Goodbye, Kalik, my love! <sighs> the powers of the sun will turn against me! What have you done? What have you done? Bye, Anvina, my love. Few will remember your name, yet this day you changed the course of destiny. What was once corrupt is now pure. Heroes, do not let her sacrifice be in vain. Even though Envina had to go, a small piece of her would always remain within Kalik's heart and even literally save his life. Kalik, he would move on and find love with another magical girl, but Envina Teague, she would never be far away from his thoughts. Sometimes you'll have to make a great sacrifice for the one you love, but even though we can't always be together, we'll always be in each other's heart. Number 6 goes to an orcish couple, Duraten and Draka. Duraten and Draka were both born in the Frostwolf clan, but Duraten didn't notice Draka for the longest of times. Not only did he have other things on his mind, like building his friendship with Orgrim and preparing to be a chieftain, it was also because Draka was born sick and fragile. She was not strong enough to be a real part of the clan, so she and her family, they were forced to move to the outskirts of the village. One day, Draka simply had enough, and she asked Mother Kesher for something, a potion, an elixir, a prayer, anything that would make her strong stronger and a worthy member of the clan. Mother Kesher, she communicated with the spirits and she placed Draka on a journey. She would have to bring back the feather of a windrock, the horn of a tallbuck and the fur of a mighty cleft hoof. Draka assumed that these items would be used for some sort of potion that would magically change her into something worthy, but it was not the potion, but the journey that changed her. When she returned after completing these impossible tasks, she was told to look in the water at her own reflection. Draka, she was not a warrior born, she was a warrior maid, and at the Kosh Ark festival, Duraten finally noticed his mate for life. 
He asked Draka to join him on a hunt, and in Orcish culture, this is actually a courtship ritual. Durton imagined, seeing how he was going to be the future chieftain, that it was going to be an easy task to get Draka to come with him. Who would say no to such a match, but apparently Draka, she was one of those orcs that could say no. She refused to join Durton on this hunt, with the excuse that she was not of age yet, but she made it sound more like an excuse than an actual reason. Thankfully for Durotan, he was not easily pushed away, and he invited her again to join him on a hunt, only this time it was not in a romantic sense, he just wanted someone to come with him as two proud warriors, and to this, Draka agreed. The hunting was a great experience, they complimented each other, they tracked down their prey, but as they did, they encountered a massive wolf, and this wolf was hunting the same prey as they were. Normally, a group of orcs would be required to bring down such a beast, but Durotan and Draka, they were able to win the fight. Durotan was injured though, and as Draka healed his wounds, he told Durotan a secret. Today was the day that she would become of age and their time together had shown both of them that they were meant to be, that they would be mates for life. From that moment on, Draka stood at Durotan's side as he led the Frostwolf clan during trying times. The horde was formed, they were pushed into a war against the Draenei, something Durotan knew in his body that this was the wrong course of action. The planet got corrupted, their people turned green, the dark portal was created and they did invade Azeroth. An orc can only take so much and at some point Durotan, he actually spoke out against the actions of the horde and for this, he and his clan were exiled. This exile was enough proof to them that what Durotan knew about Gul'dan, that Gul'dan only used the Horde to get more power, that they were right. They knew that someone had to be told, so Durotan and Draka, together with their young child Thrall, they met with Orgrim Doomhammer. Durotan had wanted Draka to stay behind, but she was his mate, and she would not step away from his side. They were in this together, and after informing Orgrim, and Orgrim promising that he would take action, they also lost their lives together. Gul'dan had sent assassins to take them out. But the young Sang Thrall, he was left to die to the wilds. Fate had other plans in mind for Thrall as we all know, but his parents' love for each other, it saw them through some of the darkest days the orcs ever had to face. They were made for each other, they stood at each other's side through good and bad, and their actions gave a whole faction a chance to change and become something better. Speaking of Thrall, at number 5 I've placed Agra with Thrall, also known as Goel. This love story grew within the novels, so those that only play the games, they might have been a little bit surprised around the Cataclysm when Goel suddenly showed up with his mates. Their love story begins just before the Cataclysm, where Goel leaves the Horde in Garrosh's hands to discover what's happening to the world. His journey leads him to Outland, where Agra helps Goel with his vision quest to become a better shaman and get a strong connection to the spirits and the elements. At first, Agra, she treats well cold. She had grown up with stories about Durotan and Draka, and she aspired especially to be like Draka. Goel had come back to Nagram before, but only to quickly go back to his alien planet. Here he had returned for a second time, now to come home and only to gain knowledge to save this alien planet once again, and at first Agra, she didn't understand. Not until she joined Goel on his vision quest, and she saw what life he had lived, what a large heart he had, and that he wanted to save not just his own people, but the entire world. She would join him as a voice of reason upon the wind, his solid foundation as strong as the earth, and his passion and heart as in fire and water. Goel would be the same for her if she would have him, and naturally she would. Together they traveled back to Azeroth to an uncertain future, in which together they had to stand against threats like the might of Deathwing, old gods, and even the elements. Their love was strong enough to overcome these things, and Goel soon knew that Agra was his mate for life. They held a wedding at Mount Hyjal, which was disturbed by the Druids of the Flame. They knew Goel would be a problem for their plans, so they split him into the four elements and he scattered him across the elemental plane. Their plan might have succeeded, but what they didn't count on was Agra and her stubbornness. She, together with heroes of Azeroth, they traveled to the elemental planes and they brought back Goel in one piece and they were able to say their vows and become mates. For so long as I live, I will stand at your side as you have stood at mine. I stand before you, Agralan, daughter of Rial, daughter of Saran, and I will proudly be your mate, Goel. In this world, or any other,
During all of this, Agra, she had become pregnant with Goel's first child, which she gave birth to somewhere around the Darkspear Rebellion, and now we find Randrenor again at her mate's side. She has given birth to their second child, now we don't know who is taking care of the children. But here we see it, Agra and Goel, they too found out that love, it can give you the strength to carry on, even through the darkest of times. They stood together against impossible odds, and to this day, their love remains strong. Number 4 is for Trevelyan and Illyria. As we see throughout these storylines, war can have a devastating effect on love, while it can also bring people together. Trevelyan and Illyria, they met each other during the Second War, as Trevelyan was chosen to be one of the generals within the Alliance army, and Illyria, she showed up with a small token force of High Elves, ready to support the war. Her leaders did not see the Orcus Horde as a real threat, but Illyria disagreed with their vision. She wanted to show her support and to fight for her home, so she too joined the Alliance. The first time that Trevelyan saw Illyria, he was blown away by her beauty and grace. Illyria saw the effect that she had on him and she actually enjoyed playing with those feelings but as Trevelyan grew in his role as leader so too did she get more feelings for him. One rainy night Illyria showed up at Trevelyan's tent soaking wet from the rain tears on her cheeks. Trevelyan had dreamed so many times of her showing up at his door but never like this. She told him that she was cold so cold and she whispered to him Vendalo Eranu which at the time Trevelyan he didn't know what it meant of course but he had it translated and it means help me forget. He helped her out of her wet clothes, he drew the fur about them both and for that night they were warm. You'd imagine that their love and future was a bright one after this night together, but actually the opposite happened. Illyria, she became more distant and cold towards Trevelyan, and he didn't understand why. Illyria became filled with hatred and she wanted to murder every single orc that she could get her hands on. This made her reckless in battle and Trevelyan feared that Illyria would get herself killed. It wasn't until the Alliance stepped through the dark portal to take the battle to the orcs that they finally would talk it out and figure out what was going on. Illyria had lost many of her family and people to the orcs and on that night that she came to Trevelyan she felt broken and lost. She couldn't properly grieve for her people because doing so would mean facing the reality that they were truly gone. Instead she had decided to hide her feelings, get a revenge upon the orcs and Trevelyan he could understand her feelings but he couldn't let her join the war for she was too reckless. Illyria refused to stay behind. She couldn't stay behind and see another person she loves die. With that confession Illyria finally allowed allowed herself to grieve, and they spent the night talking things out. Trevelyan, he agreed to let Illyria fight. Now that she had grieved for those that she lost, he felt that she wasn't that reckless anymore, and they promised each other to never again leave each other behind. Their love had found a way through grief and pain, and together they stood against the orcs, and they even survived the destruction of Drenor. They kept the promise they made each other, since both of them haven't been seen in years. It's still uncertain what exactly happened to these two, and not even Ketgar can give a clear answer. One thing that we can be certain about is that Whatever happened to them, wherever they ended up, one thing's for certain, these two will be together. Illyria, she allowed herself to be vulnerable and open to Trellian, and she found a loving heart ready to keep her safe. Which brings us to the top 3 of our list, and the choices became more difficult, but on this spot I've placed Tyrana Whisperwind and Malfurion Stormrage. Tyrana and Malfurion, they grew up together in the Nidal society, so they were childhood friends. Malfurion, he studied the ways of the druids, under the guidance of the demigod Cenarius, while Tyrande was a priestess of a loon. There was a third person to their group, Illidan Stormrage, who, like his twin brother, he tried to find his path in nature, but he didn't have the patience. Illidan's destiny was the traditional way of magic, and he believed that Tyrande was part of that destiny. He openly expressed his feelings towards Tyrande, he tried to win her heart, while Malfurion, he was more shy about his emotions, but he felt just as strong, if not stronger. During this time, the War of the Ancients began, where the Night Elves they had to stand against the Legion and even their own Queen Azara. All three of them, each in their own way, they helped in the battle against the darkness, but throughout the storyline, Tyrande realized just how deep Malfurion was in her heart and she made her choice. This choice became clear to Illidan and it pushed him away from their group. He decided that he would follow his own plans and he pretended to join Azara, while in reality he was working against them. In the end, they managed 
managed to stop the Legion from invading, the land of Kalandor split apart, and Illidan, he used some of the waters he had taken from the Well of Eternity to make a new well. The Night Elves had just fought a war, they had lost countless of lives over the abuse of the original well, so they were not pleased with his actions. They actually wanted to execute Illidan on the spot, but his brother Malfurion, he stood up for Illidan, and he requested that he would be imprisoned for life. The Night Elves agreed, they locked Illidan away while the World Tree Northern Sail was built over the well. Not only did this give the Night Elves immortality, it would also protect the world from the source of power hidden beneath it. You might imagine that with the war won and immortality at their side, that Tyrande and Malfurion, they would now finally be free to let the love grow and share their immortal lives together. Malfurion's calling as a druid, it kept them apart. He and those that follow his path would spend years walking the Emerald Dream. They learned more about nature and their crafts, while Tyrande, she was left behind to lead their people. Patience, Tyrande. Millennia went by as Tyrande waited for her dream guy. Malfurion and the Druids, they would wake up from time to time, sometimes even to save the world, like during Warcraft 3, but they would always have to return. It seemed like Malfurion's calling would always keep them apart, until the events of the novel Stormrage. In this story, we find out that Malfurion has been trapped within the Emerald Dream, and is now known as the Emerald Nightmare, and Tyrande, she's granted a vision by a loon showing her that things have taken a turn for the worst. Malfurion Furion is now actually dying, so Tyrande realizes that the moment has come, she has to do something, she has to do anything to make sure to save her beloved. Together with Brawl Bearmantle and several other characters, they discover that Archdruid Stackhelm, he's been corrupted by the Emerald Nightmare, and he's working for the evil beings behind this corruption. They're able to confront and overpower the Archmage, while also liberating Malfurion, and they cleanse the dream from the nightmare. Together, Malfurion and Tyrande, they stand against those that are trying to break them apart, and together they show the world that these two can take on anything, as long as they face it together. 10,000 years ago, they had each other's backs, their love had given them strength to do incredible things, and to this day, their love has only grown. Malfurion's calling has kept them apart, this much is true, but now the old archdruid, he realized that Tyrande simply deserves more. At the end of the story, they have a wedding to officially announce their love to the world, and Malfurion and Tyrande, they're now leading their people together. Sometimes life has a way to keep us apart from each other, but nothing can stand in love's way when given enough time. These two have taken the long distance relationship to the extreme, but they got out of it, and now they're stronger than ever before. Number two is for a love couple most of you know, Arthas Menifil and Jaina Proudmoore. These two met at a very young age as Jaina was traveling to Dalaran to study the magical arts. Arthas was immediately intrigued by Jaina and he wanted to get to know her better, so he offered his father to personally escort Jaina to Dalaran. This was not only good for politics, it was the perfect opportunity for Arthas to interact with Jaina, and one night he suggested that they should sneak away from their guards and check out one of the orcish internment camps. Arthas had a feeling that Jaina wasn't one of those fragile little girls like his sister was, and he was right. Together they checked out the camp and Arthas, he only saw murderous monsters, while Jaina saw creatures which he pitied. They looked very sad to her and they couldn't be that bad considering that they had children and all, but Arthas disagreed. Together they sneaked back to their camp, they nearly got caught, but the darkness was their cover and they made it back safely. This was the birth of a friendship which would be the foundation of a great love and Arthas would find reasons to visit Jaina while she studied in Dalaran. There was another in Dalaran that felt more for Jaina, namely Kilfa Sunstrider. But Jaina, she did not share those feelings. She had kissed Arthas before after a friendly snowball fight, and one day Arthas pulled Jaina into the shadows for a kiss. But right behind them was Kilfas, who was trying to give her a book that she had dropped on the floor. Kilfas discovered the little secret. Anger and hatred flared across his face, but when he looked at Jaina, it all dropped and he felt nothing but pain and regrets. He was sad that Jaina did not choose him, and insulted that Arthas would not openly and proudly court Jaina, but he would keep their secrets despite his own feelings. This love couple would find it hard to be together, considering Jaina had her studies in Dalaran, while Arthas was training to become not only a paladin, but also a ruler of a kingdom. But they did not let things like that stop them. During the Wickerman celebration, Jaina visited Arthas, where she lit the Wickerman with a great spectacle by the use of her magic and her fire spells, and Arthas told her that she did such a good job that she would probably have to do it every year. Jaina asked Arthas if that would really be a problem to see each other each year to be together like that, and Jaina 
wanted to be with Arthas and he felt the same. Suddenly they found themselves in Arthas' chamber where Jaina asked if they were ready for this. Arthas had turned down many women before but Jaina was special and Arthas was ready to let her in completely into his heart. That night they shared their love as the wickerman burned outside. Arthas held Jaina close and he told her as he had the first day they kissed, don't Deny me, Jaina. Don't ever deny me, please. She looked up at him, eyes glittering in the cool moonlight. I never would, Arthas. Never. And yet, some things are simply not meant to be. During the Feast of Wintervale, Arthas and Jaina, they were at a ball together and they were talking about the future. Children, marriage, and all of a sudden, Arthas felt deep inside that he wasn't ready yet. What if he was not worthy of Jaina? He felt too young, not ready for all of this, and he tried to explain to Jaina these feelings that he didn't understand himself. Desperately, he thought to himself, please Jaina, understand, even if I don't. And of course, Jaina did. She was hurt, of course, and she didn't really understand what Arthas felt. But Arthas had always been her friend, and for him, she would be a friend as well. They returned to the ball as friends, and after that, they went their separate ways, until the plague spread across the lands of Lordaeron, and Arthas and Jaina were put on a task to investigate. At first, their little reunion, it was a little bit awkward, but they quickly overcame it, and it felt like no time had passed at all. They'd always worked brilliantly together, and now they were on the same mission, trying to find out what happened to the people and where this plague was coming from. Eventually they figured out that the plague it did not only kill people, it also turned them into the undead. At Strathholm, Arthas made the impossible choice of purging the city and for the first time Jaina denied him. You've just crossed a terrible threshold Arthas. Jaina? I'm sorry Arthas. I can't watch you do this. Jaina could not stand by and watch Arthas slaughter a village, so she walked away and Arthas did what he felt was right, even though he was doubting every step of the way. This would be the end for their relationship, since Arthas, he fell to darkness, eventually became the Lich King, while Jaina took those that she could and she saved their lives. It would not mean the end of their love though, even when Arthas attacked Dalaran and faced off against Kilfas, Jaina would always be on his mind and she would always be his weakness. When Arthas woke Woke up after years of reflecting on his life, Jaina could feel it in her very soul. And once we defeated the Lich King, we found out that he had always kept Jaina's lockets. What's this? He... he kept it. All this time, he kept it. I knew. I sensed a part of him still alive, trapped, struggling. Oh, Arthas, perhaps, perhaps he might someday remember what he once was. By the light, may he at last find rest, free from the icy grip of that terrible blade. Who knows what might have happened if Arthas didn't get cold feet and stepped away from their relationship, but it's always easy to look back and see what could have been different. These two, they made their choices, and even though they were not meant to be, their love was strong, so strong, that not even becoming the Lich King could freeze the flame. Which brings us to the top of the list. For me, at number one, there could be no other than the story of Coriastras and Alexstrasza, the Lifebinder. Who else but the Lifebinder herself, she who loves all creation. There could really be no other than these two at the top of the list. The story behind these two is a, a very large one. Dragons, they've been around for millennia, and although Alexstrasza has multiple consorts, Coriastras was special. He was her prime consort, and their connection was incredibly strong. When the Bronze Dragon Osdormu was trapped in time, he sent Coriastras back to the Warfy Ancients, not only to help out the Night Elves fight the Legion, but to also prevent the Old Gods from breaking out of their prisons. Coriastras, he was unable to transform into his dragon form, since in this reality, in this timeline, there were now two copies of him, while his younger self was unable to transform as well, so he was stuck in his dragon form. Even with being a duplicate, Alexstrasza, she saw Coriastras for who he was, and she trusted his words. She was 
was smart enough to not pry information about the future from Coriolstras, and Coriolstras, although he wished deep down that he could warn her about the dark future, he kept his mouth shut. This dark future would be the imprisonment and enslavement of Alexstrasza by the hands of the orcs. During the first horde invasion, the orcs they were sent visions by Deathwing, which showed them the location of the demon soul. Deathwing himself, he was now unable to wield the demon soul, so he manipulated the orcs into capturing Alexstrasza, and the orcs forced their children to fight for the hordes. Not only that, they also forced Alexstrasza to breed more children, and of course Alexstrasza, she did not want to aid the hordes, she did not want to see her children go into a war. But as she disobeyed, the orcs, they smashed their axe in front of her eyes and they smeared the yoke on her face. Alexstrasza is the life binder and such an act was the most brutal thing that they could do, so Alexstrasza obeyed. Coriostras, he was not captured by the orcs and he used his influence in disguise known as Cressus to set events in motion to liberate his queen and his beloveds. He placed the mage Ronin together with several others on a mission to go to Grimbatol and rescue his queen. At the same time he convinced the other dragon aspects to come out of hiding and together they were able to not only liberate Alexstrasza but also destroy the demon soul. The mortals of this world had always been a concern for Cressus and Alexstrasza understood that concern more more than others. She understood the love Cressus had for what some of the other dragons refer to as the lesser races, so they did not spend all their time together, but it did not matter. For millennia, their love had been strong even when they were apart, and you can even see it in Dragon Blight, where Cressus stands at the side of his queen. Sad to say, their love story, it does not have a happy ending. As the hour of twilight draws closer, and Deathwing's madness is spreading across the world, Coriolstras, he finds out that the Twilight's Hammer Clan, they'd infiltrated the sanctums beneath the Wormrest Temple. This is the location where the dragons kept their eggs, and as Alexstrasza attended to a meeting, Coriolstras, he tries to defend the clutch. He's successful in taking out the members of the Twilight's Hammer Clan, but the damage, it's already done. They've infected the eggs, and not just the red eggs, they've infected all the sanctum, all the eggs that are hidden there, and the corruption is spreading. This corruption will turn the unhatched hatchlings into chromatic dragons and Coriolstras knows that there's no time and he has to make the ultimate sacrifice. On his mind, for the final time, as she always was, is his beloved Red Queen Alexstrasza. He uses all of his powers, every bit of his life energy, and he links all the portals of all the sanctums together and then he implodes, destroying the corrupted eggs and preventing a much bigger problem. Now, Naturally up above, they had no idea what was going on down below and at first Alexstrasza, she's heartbroken. Not only did she just lose the love of her life, she also has the glimmer of doubt that Coriolstras betrayed them all. The lifebinder's heart is broken and she travels to Desolace where she just sits down and waits for death to take her. She's already lost her children, she already lost the love of her life, she's already dead in all ways except for one and that death will surely come soon. Fral is set on a mission to help out the aspects and he tries to talk Alexstrasza out of her depression, but not even Wonderboy Thrall is able to heal the pain. Eventually, Thrall is granted a vision by the spirits of life that show him the truth. He sees how Coriolstras finds out about the corruption, how he tries to defend the eggs, how he made the ultimate sacrifice in the name of love with his beloved on his mind. Thrall returns to Alexstrasza, he shares with her the vision that was granted, and Alexstrasza, she finally allows herself to grieve. From the tears of the life binder, life itself blooms up around them and Alexstrasza, she manages to pull herself out of her depression and she realized that Coriolstras was the best of them. He sacrificed everything, knowing how it might look to all of them, knowing that they might see him as a traitor and still he sacrificed himself for the greater good. After this, as you might know, the Aspects, they team up with Thrall, they stop several of Deathwing's plans, amongst them of course the final confrontation at the end of the Cataclysm. They manage to prevent the Hour of Twilight, they save the world, and even though Alexstrasza is no longer the Aspect, her love and her heart are still the same. She loves all beings, all life on Azeroth, and Coriolstras he was most dear to her. For him, she was his world, and he traveled through time, he battled against unspeakable forces, he made the ultimate sacrifice just for her. Tragic as it may be, it's also a beautiful love story. 
And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, my top 10 love stories in World of Warcraft. I truly hope you enjoyed my top 10, and I really wonder what you guys and girls would place at number 1. Do you agree with my choice? Is Alexstrasza and Coriolstras the best, or would you have placed Jaina and Arthas there? Would you have decided on a whole different couple to be number 1? Please let me know in the comments down below, I can't wait to read all your comments. Valentine's Day is coming up, ladies and gentlemen, and if you have someone special to share it with, then I'll hope you have a fantastic day, and if you don't care about all that commercial lovey-dovey stuff just remember next day the candy will be on sale have a great week everyone subscribe if you like my videos and until next time guys see ya